Thank you everyone for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with us today. And I want to thank the Social Venture Collaborative as well as the volunteers that have really helped make this event possible. I'm really excited about this panel. Um, so welcome, this is the Inspiring Approaches panel and we're going to be focusing on models across uh, the New England region that are supporting social enterprise and those types of efforts. We're also going to talk about lessons learned and focus on how we can support the ongoing efforts here in central Massachusetts in the Worcester region. At the end we're going to leave time for questions so please make sure to save those questions for the end. If we don't get to all of the questions please know that there are some post-its or maybe some writing materials that if you'd like to write your question down if it doesn't get answered just put your question, your name, and your email and I'll make sure that I connect you with the presenters and people that can get you the information and help you um, move on to the next steps. Just a quick change to our program today. Unfortunately, Kelly Ramirez from Social, um, from Social Enterprise Greenhouse cannot be with us today, but the lovely Billy uh, Kepner has come here in her place. So, yes. So before we get started, I just want to introduce our panelists, and then we'll move right into questions. Um, so first we have Sarah Jimenez. She worked on Boston Ujima Project for over a year, starting in the summer of 2015. She was a startup organizer for the project and simultaneously documented the unfolding of the project as a reflective practitioner. As a way to leverage her master's thesis requirement to support and advance the work, the work of imagining economic democracy, and in particular, democratic finance. More recently, she has been focusing her work on a, as a campaign researcher for Community Labor Coalition in Boston, but remains in touch with Ujima Project and is excited to share her experience with the project with everyone here today. Billy Kepner is a communicator with over 16 years of experience working in public relations, communications, and fundraising. He started his professional career in 1999 as an AmeriCorps VISTA representative where he worked as a director for marketing and public relations at a nonprofit in rural Pennsylvania. Over the past 16 years, Billy has worked in both public and private sectors doing communications, marketing, and fundraising. His most recent role at Cornell University where he coordinated the marketing and public relations for Cornell Plantations, the university's botanic gardens. Huh? Oh, sorry. Over the past six years, Billy helped to build brand awareness, increase visitorship to Plantation's mini holdings, and work to increase memberships and fundraising at Cornell Plantations through communications. Billy is excited to work with Social, Social Enterprise Greenhouse, its partners and ventures, and the board of directors to help increase awareness, to help create and implement a development strategy that will lead Social Enterprise Greenhouse into the future. Finally, as Reset's Managing Director, Ajala Naeem, combines her passions in economic and community development and supports entrepreneurs at Reset's Business Factory. For the past five years, Ojala has focused on growing the entrepreneurial community in Connecticut and building support infrastructure to strengthen and encourage innovation and entrepreneurship in the state. Ojala spearheaded the development of the Reset Business Factory, a center of entrepreneurial activity in Hartford that provides programs and support services to entrepreneurs. Ojala has worked closely with the legislative process in the state of Connecticut as Reset spearheaded the passage of benefit corporations and is now working on implementing benefit LLCs in the state as well. Um, first, if you guys could just give a brief statement about your organization to help everyone understand what you're doing and then focus mainly on the support um, models that you use for social enterprise in your locations. I still have to project. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, having us here today. I'm really excited to share Ujima with everybody. Um, Ujima is uh, based out of the Boston area, and uh, it is um, a multi stakeholder effort, uh, emergent experiment with a number of political based building organizations, uh, new economy practitioners, co op developers, financers, uh, co ops themselves. And Ten to a thousand dollars, or whatever amount, um, and then they would control where that money goes to themselves, rather than having outsiders be in charge of build development and business development in that company in their uh, communities. Um, and the idea is, once we have this, um, once we have this array, uh, this resource of community uh, finance capital, um, and that means we have a little bit of power to say, you know, what are the things that we want to support. 
Um, we want to support good, good businesses that create good jobs, that have good environmental practices, that think about community benefits. Um, and, then, and then once we have those businesses, how do we support them and help them thrive in a wider environment that's very much still raised to the bottom, that actually suppresses wages, that actually makes bad jobs, that breaks the environment. Um, so uh, part of the way that we, would, we hope to support them is you know, through consumer organizing. You know, we're not just investors, but we're also consumers, so we can choose where our dollars go. Um, and then also uh, uh, creating a network of technical assistance. So not just how do you run your business, but impact assistance. How do you run your business in a way that's helpful to the community? Um, so this up here um, is not meant to be overwhelming, but I understand that it often is. And it's just kind of a representation of this ecosystem that is run according to solidarity economy values as opposed to neoliberal capital values that we hope that UGMA will catalyze. Thanks. Hey everyone, my name is Ojala Name with Reset in Hartford. We're a nonprofit organization that's focused on supporting impact driven businesses uh, launch, grow, or scale. Uh, our focus is really to see more businesses uh, tackling some of the problems that are uh, popping up in their communities, uh, trying to create solutions to some of the socioeconomic hurdles, uh, especially in a city like Hartford, which is not too different from uh, some of the challenges that we see here in Worcester. Um, we've been around for about five years, and our model is really focused around providing all the different support services that an entrepreneur will need. You'll probably hear the term ecosystem being thrown around a lot. Um, it's become a little bit of a buzzword, uh, but we'll, we're, our focus is to really uh, put together an ecosystem with the entrepreneur in the middle. So we provide all sorts of services, maybe from business development, financial modeling, maybe through investment through some of our partnerships with uh, venture funds in Connecticut, as well as national organizations like Kiva, who does micro lending for uh, early stage companies that are looking to launch a project. Uh, we also work with educational institutions, which is a very, very important piece of building up an ecosystem, uh, trying to figure out how do we take the pipeline of students that is coming out from local colleges and universities, how do we keep them in our state, in our region, um, and how do we make sure that they have jobs and opportunities once they're graduating, at, graduating out so they're not all flocking to Boston or New York or out uh, into the West Coast. Uh, we also focus on figuring out how do we engage the corporate community to support the entrepreneurs that are looking to get off the ground. So we manage a very strong mentor network in Connecticut, um, really serving as the in-between between folks that want to help businesses get off the ground and succeed, um, and then working directly with the business and making sure that they have all the opportunities they need. Uh, so that's just a little bit about what we do, uh, who we are. Pass it around to Bill. I have my own. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Billy Kepner, and I am from Social Enterprise Greenhouse, which is located in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we do some, we do things very similar to um, what they're doing in Hartford. We actually think of ourselves as an organization that helps grow, do well, do good businesses. Um, one of the, we started about seven years ago. Well, no, pardon me, in 2007, we started as um, a chapter of Social Venture Partners. Um, about 2012, we transferred over um, our 501c3 into this social enterprise greenhouse to really take our organization to the next level. We do many of the same things. We provide incubators, we have accelerator programs, we have, um, for later stage uh, ventures, we have what we call the huddle. Um, you have a, your business might have an issue that they're trying to get over, um, and we bring together mentors from our very diverse group. We have about nearly 300 mentors in our pipeline um, that serve uh, several different um, ventures that we have going through our accelerator programs and that are members of our hub. So we also have a co-working space that opened in April of last year, um, we had to expand it in June, and so we had to we had to take over a second floor to to fit demand, and we're now looking for more space in the building. Um, Social Enterprise Greenhouse is this amazing little community thing that happened in Providence, but it spreads out across the whole state. Um, we have relationships with every public official. Um, I was at a meeting with the Secretary of State just two days ago. Um, 
the governor's chief of staff was at another meeting I was at two days ago. It's very important um, to have those connections and have that be part of your pipeline. Um, I think that sort of explains what we do in a, in a very tight nutshell. And can you guys talk maybe a little bit about how you came to your core values and the different support mechanisms and services that you offer the people and companies that you work with? Whoever would like to start. Uh, back in 2010, there wasn't really much happening in Connecticut around entrepreneurship. Um, startups were a thing that was really about Silicon Valley or New York City. Um, so we put out a meeting and said, listen, we want to figure out ways to do business differently, to have business really affect the local communities and work with the local communities. Uh, if you're interested in talking about it, why don't you come in and, and let's have a meeting. Expected to get a handful of people, maybe 20, 30 people. Uh, so hosted a meeting in City Hall in Hartford, and we ended up getting 200 folks that came in. Uh, similar event to this, just getting the community together. Um, and we said, all right, so, so what do we want to do? What would this look like? Um, and throughout the day, as we talked about what are some of the challenges that we face locally, what are some of the challenges that businesses face, um, we recognized sort of five areas of action that we really wanted to pursue. Um, it was in terms of strengthening legislation so that businesses have better opportunities in Connecticut. It was to figure out how to provide more investment opportunities for uh, early stage entrepreneurs or individuals that um, are coming from either uh, you know, underserved populations, low income that might not be able to qualify for low interest rate bank loans or be able to acquire the investment they need to take the risk to start a business. Um, it was about educating the community uh, on you know, what, what is an impact driven business, what is social enterprise, um, how, how, why is it important. Um, it was also about figuring out how to provide programs and services into the community. Um, and then the final piece was how do we connect with the colleges and universities to make sure that students are preparing for the future ahead of them. Um, and from that event, we split out into these five action teams. And uh, for the next two years, mainly volunteer run, um, had meetings to say, okay, let's come up with an action plan. Let's come up with a strategy to actually be able to enact some of the goals that we've got set in place. Um, and so it took a while, and you know when you're working with a lot of volunteers, it's a lot of time and dedication that they're putting in, um, but it's also challenging because it, they're doing it uh, in their free time. It took a while to get off the ground, and by 2012, we had a clear action plan in place um, that we wanted to kind of see through over the next five years, so from 2012 to 2017. Um, and fall of 2012, we started acting upon it. Uh, we opened up our incubator space in downtown Hartford, uh, we launched an investment fund. We had a, built some strong relationships with colleges and universities, so started working with students. Um, and things really got off the ground. We were able to uh, achieve all the goals that we had set in 2012 by the end of 2014, which is really exciting for us. Um, but I think the most important piece was that if we didn't have the support of the community at large. Uj the Boston Ujima Project is um, kind of uh, emerged in this space at the intersection of political organizing and alternative institution building. Uh, so one of the, the catalytic individuals was Aaron Tanaka of the Center for Economic Democracy. Um, and, and in coming up or in, 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 uh, in catalyzing this visioning process for what uh, economic democracy and democratic finance could look like, he was drawing deeply on his experience as an organizer in one of Boston's um, base building organizations, the Boston Workers Alliance. Um, and it's a, a number of um, base building political organizations in Boston had started to experiment with co-op development. Um, you know, their memberships are workers, uh, and their workers are interested in, you know, what are ways that we can start taking control of our own uh, economic destinies. Uh, we spend all this time fighting against corporations, fighting against policies, we're fighting for policies, for wages, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's sort of, um, a, so it's new territory a little bit for political organizations to start looking into economic modeling, um, new alternative economic modeling. Um, so uh, the, the idea for finance actually came out of this uh, summer long um, working group. There was a study group. It was, um, I think, over 50 individuals from almost as many different organizations participated in this um, eight session conversation about you know what are the needs of our um, of our community 
uh, how can finance help meet those needs, how can uh, finance or banking help meet those, meet those needs, and how do we, uh, how do we um, organize our activities so that we're all pulling together for broader economic transformation um, instead of just bit, um, you know, pieces of work here and there that are isolated. So um, if you take a little look um, at, at the uh, Ujima ecosystem, uh, there are a lot of concepts in there that are from um, both you know, political organizing and from uh, alternative economic development, uh, sorry, alternative economic building, um, components that have existed in successful, uh, existed successfully in different places, but often in isolation, and we were trying to figure out how do we interlock them so that they can be stronger together and create kind of a gestalt that's created in some of the parts. So participatory budgeting, which Emily mentioned earlier, is actually one of the core um, ideas that is built into the Ujima project vision, which is that you know once you have this uh, pool of finance, uh, finance capital, uh, you know rather than have it allocated based on profit maximization, uh, you know why don't we use our participatory budgeting process to decide well what are the things that our community actually needs? Um, so uh, so this visioning process uh, is uh, is actually still ongoing. Um, Ujima is in a kind of a, a, a feasibility study process right now, and we've been engaging in lots of conversations with stakeholders. It's a multi-stakeholder conversation, so it's not just one group or another, but we have, uh, we have uh, community groups, and we have financers, and we have business developers, and we have businesses who are all in dialogue with one another about how this system could work and how we can help each other survive and thrive. Um, and we've been, uh, so last August we uh, ran a, an experiment, uh, hopefully one of a series of experiments and how an actual investment process could happen. Um, so we, we picked uh, five um, good local community businesses run by people of color in the neighborhood who had a track record of, uh, of um, uh, community interest. And we brought together about 175 community investors uh, who all donated through the Kiva platform. And um, and uh, and we went through a uh, a day long deliberative process where we talked where you know consumer investors of community members were in dialogue with business owners and you know saying here's what I can do for the community here's what the community wants from you here's how the community can support you and then we ended up uh, and the community was able to um, then make an investment um, so we hope so this is a it's a very emergent experimental process where trying to push forward and, and uh, embrace some of the fail forward uh, mentality that, uh, that some of the successful startups in other spaces have been working on. Sure. Uh, you know, when our organization was started as SVPRI, um, it was a group of investors that had wanted to, they wanted to look at philanthropy in a different way. They wanted to help support communities that could support themselves. And one of the things that they noted were there were a lot of um, great ideas happening in Providence, but there wasn't a lot of momentum behind those ideas. So they took that funding that they would otherwise invest in other companies to get a return, and they brought in Kelly, who um, was a one-stop shop for quite a while, to help look at those other organizations, businesses, nonprofits, that were trying to create industry and give people jobs. And Kelly would work with them on how to create a business plan. So she would do an incubator program. And then as it grew, and some of our funding grew, and we got some more grants, we were able to do accelerator programs. So over the course of several years, our organization has grown into this, um, you know, I use greenhouse because that's what our name is, where we're growing this business but we also have, you know, we have an accelerator program. We have a huddle. We also have a loan fund. Um, we offer below market value loans to um, uh, social enterprises who are, maybe they're scaling up. Maybe they need a machine to do their, in, to, to make their um, business really be successful. Uh, we help in all ways. Um, but it was a really hard process. And it, it, it's hard to raise funds for a nonprofit that's giving money to help business or help businesses, even though the businesses are doing good work, it, it's still a hard, I hate to use the word, but it's a hard sale. Um, and that's my job as a director of development and communications is how do I explain that effectively to um, individuals who we think might be a good partner? 
And so we started in the business section. We started in the business sector working with entrepreneurs who've had success, who've created their own companies, and brought them in as, as entrepreneurs, and brought them in as um, mentors to help. And that's sort of how our funding model sort of works. We have a lot of grants, um, and we do have quite a bit of individual giving. We still have um, what we call a, a partner do. So we have a, I call them the founding partners. They were the folks that originally started SVPRI, and they have to give um, a certain amount of dollars every year as part of their membership, and that's how we help support our organization. Can, can you guys, we'll do questions at the end. Can you guys um, talk a little bit about who have been the most critical partners in your communities or in your state that have allowed you to magnify um, the work that you're doing? Sure, I have not start with the microphone on. <laughs> um, government. In, in Rhode Island, we're very lucky that our state um, is very small. So we're the size of a major city. Um, and we work very closely with government, and one of government's main interests is to bring in and activate business in the community. It's also to put people to work, and that's what these social enterprises are doing. They are creating businesses that are actually putting people to work and actually giving them a living wage. That is really compelling. So we've had a lot of support from um, the Department of Labor and Training, um, the governor's office, and from all, both sides of um, the aisle, from both the Republican governors and now the Democrat governor, have been very supportive of creating jobs. And that's the one thing about this new economy, and I, I know a lot of people are trying to see what the new world order is going to be like with, with the way the election turned out. But one of the things to remember is that job creation is always very important. In creating jobs, in creating jobs in communities, is always something that the government is going to be supportive of, and it's going to try to do. So we need to help foster that and help foster social entrepreneurs to be able to do their work. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree 100%. Uh, for us, government support has been uh, critical to getting off the ground. In fact, if it wasn't for uh, the state of Connecticut and their initiative on uh, folk building out an uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem in the state, um, we may have been delayed even more in getting off the ground and being able to implement what we needed to. That being said, uh, government's not going to want to fund the same thing over and over for too long. Um, and that, that's a challenge. That's what we're beginning to see now, uh, being in year four of a relationship with them. Um, they want to see us be more sustainable so that they, at any point, depending on budget, depending on whatever might come up, um, if, if they can't support us, they want to make sure that we'll still continue in existence. Um, and that's, that's, I think, the challenge that most nonprofits, uh, most organizations that are working with government uh, agencies rely on. So uh, we've been beginning to take a look at what role can the corporate community play? And I'm not talking about just traditional sponsorships. Uh, they want to make sure that they align themselves with organizations like ours because then they can say, hey, but I support Reset or I support Social Enterprise Greenhouse, so I'm helping do good and I want to see businesses do good. And that's, that's, for them, that's marketing. It's not really giving back as much, um, but it's great. I support it in case anyone here is corporate. Uh, no, no offense <laughs> meant on that. Um, but there's another pathway that I think is beginning to open up uh, that's important when it comes to economic development. Um, most of these large corporations are struggling to be able to recruit in uh, the next generation of workers, uh, may it be skilled or unskilled workers. Um, millennials, right? That's a big word we hear being thrown around all over the place. Like these millennials are crazy. They have completely different ideals and views and whatnot. Well, studies have shown that one of the biggest things they look for when they're thinking about a career pathway or when they're looking at, you know, what company am I going to work for is what is that company doing for their community? What is that company doing uh, in terms of innovation? Um, you know, what's the creative flexibility they'll have as an employee of that company? Uh, that's why we think about, you know, people talk about, oh, what are some of the coolest jobs out there? It's like, oh, working for Google or working for Uber or working for Microsoft because they let you do your own projects on the side or they're doing so much to change the world. They're um, innovative disruptors. Um, and that's really what 
a lot of the young folks that are coming out into the workforce are looking for. So companies are saying, okay, so how do we how do we align with that? And they're beginning to work with a lot more local incubators, accelerators, nonprofit organizations that are doing um, economic development and community development work on the ground level. Um, and aligning with them, it's beginning to pick up and they're saying, okay, we, we, we see that the kind of the deal flow in many ways uh, when it comes to human capital, which is a really terrible way to put it, but that's that's the way they look at it. Um, and that's opened up some some areas in terms of long-term sustainability funding because we now have something that's important to their future workforce and they want to make sure that they can hold on to it as well. What have you found, if I'm, I, I can ask a question? Uh, sorry, what have you found about um, companies in, uh, in Connecticut that are looking at intrapreneurs, actually fostering entrepreneurs that do good works in their own companies? Have you seen a trend in that? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's extremely important to a lot of these companies. Um, they, if they don't have an internal entrepreneurship kind of department already, or an innovation team, um, the way they try to do it is through employee engagement opportunities. So outside of sponsorship and marketing visibility, the next most important thing for corporations is employee engagement. How do we get our employees to be able to work within the communities that they are in to be able to give some of their time back um, and so we've been able to source a lot of our mentors through that. And I think that allows those employees to have a little bit of creative flexibility. So we can have a, um, so one of the big companies in Hartford, Aetna, we can have employees coming in from Aetna, working with a startup in maybe the healthcare field, or maybe they're creating a product to change up the insurance industry. They're able to share their expertise or that gives the employee kind of some creative freedom, and then Edna also knows what's going on in terms of that business, so down the road if this business takes off, Edna's gonna be really interested in acquiring them. Um, so it, it kind of turns into this like circular model where it itself organically creates a win-win-win situation. Um, I think the biggest challenge still though is that unless you're a company in a major city like New York or Boston, um, the corporations aren't necessarily thinking so much into that. It's still new to them, and it's gonna take some time for them to understand the value and importance of it. Uh, we're, we're a little bit entrapped by the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, our funding right now is coming primarily through foundation grants, um, and, and a, a, some smaller local donations here and there. Um, of course, the, the capital is coming not from foundations, coming from community members and then also interested <coughs> investors. Uh, but we're, um, you know, we, we receive foundation funding to do this visioning process, and the critical partnership, you know, uh, as you see it, is this this ecosystem of relationships that we're building. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say so much. We're not so selective about who we want to bring into the project as we are very attentive, um, because one of our core objectives is to build power in the low-income communities of color uh, that we hope to um, uh, uh, have primary governance over this ecosystem. Um, and, and one thing that uh, base building groups are very um, aware of is this danger that if you invite too much, too deep participation from too large external players, they can kind of take over a little bit. You know, very well-meaning and, and it's great that they, wanna, that they want to be involved in this kind of work, but um, you know, we need some time on our own to build up the power and engagement of our own folks internally before we can start forming relationships with external parties. Uh, so we're, we're very lucky to have a very robust ecosystem of talents and expertise to draw on. Um, and you know, uh, one of our core partners um, is the uh, City Life Vida Urbana, which is a uh, kick-ass tenant organizing uh, group that um, has, has done a lot of uh, very innovative uh, organizing um, that's you know, drawing on, on uh, direct action as well as innovative legal action and um, financial strategies. They were kind of, they were a really good fit for the Juma project. As well as Boston Impact Initiative, uh, which is an investment fund based in Boston uh, that has kind of a transformative approach to how it builds its own portfolio, who it invests in, what the terms of the investments are, um, and then uh, you know, a whole suite of other organizations and individuals uh, who are skilled in, um, in business development and co-op incubation, uh, who, are, who are kind of 
currently everyone's volunteering their time in this project uh, because we don't uh, we don't have a, a, a robust operating fund to pay people yet. Um, but but the great thing is, um, I mean, the main resource has really been uh, um, you know Aaron. Uh, I was talking to Matt earlier that he's a uh, um, it's been a great connector, uh, bringing together this kind of diverse constituency that will, that's, you know, and, and inspiring them all to put in their unpaid time because we're all busy, we all have things to do. Um, but it's really, it's been really exciting to see what we can come up with uh, on a very kind of, in a, a very bootstrappy way. Thank you. So, in an effort to kind of keep us um, on time, I want to open it up to the audience to ask some questions. Um, if you want to start, because you were. You were mid panel. Yes, yeah, you said you're trying to uh, put uh, a couple together capital funds to use for local community and build. Put any thought into the development process on how to do that yet? Uh, yeah, we're working on it. Um, I think one of the things that's been inspiring to us uh, for that component has been participatory budgeting, uh, which you know it's it's so there's so there's a there's a. Um, there's a little bit of precedent in Boston for participatory budgeting. This is we have a youth program. Uh, young people in the city get a million dollars um, out of the city budget to decide what they want to. And there's a particular process that they follow, uh, and we wouldn't necessarily um, follow that exactly, but something similar, so that there's it's a, there's a little bit of planning um, involved, planning and voting together, so that um, people it's not so we don't just want to have like a you know, you, you, you come in right when the capital is about to be allocated and then give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. We want people to really be thinking about what are the things that we want to have in our community that's, that's lacking? Um, what, are the, you know, what are companies that are here right now that are exploiting us that we want to set up a competitor uh, to? Uh, and um, so some kind of planning process that uh, ultimately results in a democratic um, vote of some kind. Hey, uh, it's not really a question. I just wanted to inject something. Uh, I want to start off by saying uh, I speak for myself and uh, as a black male perspective, black people are not a monolith. I'm not speaking for black people uh, as a whole, but myself as a black male. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, and hopeful for the concepts of a more inclusive, uh, a more effective, more supportive economy, specifically for black folks. But I just wanted to uh, inject this here uh, for consideration. Um, Looking at the prospects, this, this seems like another plan that's going to end up whitewashed. Um, I mean, not saying that we, wherever it's going to go, but there's a, in the economy, the, the capitalist economy that we live in now, kind of <coughs> sets your valuation at uh, how much you can buy. Um, you're, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you know. That for black folks, that is uh, maximized exponentially. Um, and so I come from a community where uh, a lot of the black males, the, the leading industry uh, employer, uh, it, it's drugs. Uh, we sell, we, 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 we're undereducated, not all of us, but you know, we come from systems that undereducate under us, we got responsibility. We started off with less, we started off with deficit, and a lot of times we sold those drugs uh, for, for food and clothing, but uh, for food and shelter, but a lot of times for materialism. <coughs> your, your, value, your, your value uh is understood to be through materialism. So to talk to, uh, to black folks about going into this society or this uh, envisioning of a culture that's almost like minimalist, it doesn't seem very attractive. Um, it, it feels like you know, where, where it, when you, <laughs> there's a reason why uh, Jay-Z has uh, a, a big gold chain with a medallion that says uh, Rock Nation on it, and Bill Gates has 800 times the money as it has no chain, right? Because he doesn't need to be visible, right? He doesn't need to, he doesn't have this attractive materialism. So going forward, thank, I, I'd like for us to, to focus in this room, if it's uh, any concern of yours, uh, how are you going to cater this message? How are you going to speak to the conditioning of these, uh, generational conditioning of these people to bring them into the fold and bring them into this, uh, uh, society? Time and time again, uh, this feels like a privilege that only white folks can uh, take advantage of. Um, there's also, uh, really quickly, there's also uh, historically, since Bacon's Rebellion uh, for black folks, in the society here, the class system, black folks have been the bottom. We've been a deterrent uh, to, if you don't want to conform, you better conform or else you're going to be down there with the black folks, right? And so there's this trust amongst our allies, right? Uh, it, we, it is a, it's very clearly understood uh, for some folks, some more than others, that it is not in your best interest in a nation where your accumulation distribution of, of wealth is based on your whiteness to align yourself with black folks. So what, what, are, what is being done uh, to address those uh, underlying issues? And uh, 
and General Nassau, I'll leave it at that. So you know, here, here. Uh, inclusion and diversity is one of the cornerstones that our organization has looked at. And you know, Providence is a very diverse community. It's, it's got a very large uh, Latino uh, um, population, a Portuguese population, um, an African American population. And there's very few businesses that are coming to our organization looking for help. And so we've enacted a program to actually go out and find those businesses because we realize that we want to help communities. The west side and south side of Providence are areas that have been long, long neglected. And our organization moved to the Jewelry District, which is a long, long neglected area of downtown Providence that's being um, sort of re revitalized by Brown, um, which is another uh, huge supporter and funder for for my organization is that we do have great partnerships with universities because Rhode Island is so small, they have 11 universities, it's easy for us to work with them. We also have a, we have a change maker on every one of those campuses that are working to help uh, and educate about social enterprise and entrepreneurship. But to, to your point, you're absolutely right. We have to do better. We have to do better at trying to reach those people in, um, who are trying to start businesses who who don't have access to capital, that you know, a lot of folks are starting social enterprises and they don't even know they're doing it. And that's one of the biggest things, they don't know where to go to get help because they traditionally want to go to a bank because that's what the world tells us to do. You go to a bank. Well, everyone knows that if you, are, if you don't have a lot of capital, you're not gonna get capital. So that's one of the areas that we really are focusing on. I'm glad you brought that up because it's a real issue. And I, I'm pretty sure that you're facing the same thing in Hartford and in Boston. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for bringing a lot of those points up because it is kind of the underspoken truth about entrepreneurship. Uh, when you look at entrepreneurship, 70% of entrepreneurs are white males. Uh, that's the reality of the, of the arena. Um, why? Because there are a lot of challenges and risks that you have to take. Um, to become an entrepreneur and to give more time or money back into your community. You need to have the time, you need to have the money, you need to have the resources. That's something being in Hartford uh, that we started recognizing very quickly. Um, it was the type of situation where, okay, we're gonna build it and they're just gonna come through the door. Um, we recognized that there was a lot that we needed to do to be able to cater to the population and audience that we were within, the community that we were within, um, and a lot that we needed to do to be able to communicate with them. Um, over the last couple of years, we've really focused on how do we how, how do we diversify entrepreneurship more, and how do we give the opportunity to folks that feel like they don't have the opportunity to s start something of their own, to, to create change. Um, and it is everything from you know having access to capital without worrying about high interest rates because you've got bad credit or just being denied altogether. Um, one of the reasons why we partnered up with Kiva because it's a there's no financial underwriting. It's all what we call social underwriting, which is your community comes in to help you get off the ground at first, and then you open up your project into a larger global investor community to get funded. And there's zero zero percent uh, interest on those loans. Um, we also recognize that it's important to be in the neighborhoods that we're trying to serve. So initially, when we kicked off, we were in downtown Hartford. Downtown Hartford is like one of the most corporate areas uh, in all of Connecticut, right? Um, and it didn't work for us. We weren't able to get the folks in through the door that we wanted. And so we moved about a year and a half ago to a neighborhood of Hartford called Parkville uh, into an old factory uh, and, and said, okay, this should feel more accessible. And it was. Our move led to a 300% increase in membership. And we started seeing more folks engaging. Um, so it's not always important to be in the downtown or the heart of the city. Um, and I think that's, that's a big factor. Um, I think the, the last piece is how do you communicate to folks that they have an opportunity and that we're here to help? So it's building out our programs where, yes, we want you know, high impact, high growth entrepreneurs that are making a ton of money, but also creating a positive good out of their company. Um, but we also want to make sure that if someone feels like that's not where they are, they still have a place. So doing more to educate 
individuals on what does it mean to be an entrepreneur. So doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one workshops. You know, what is what are different legal? What what's the importance of having a legal structure? Um, what does it mean to run a business? What are the different pieces and elements of a business that you need to understand? So doing workshops and classes and coaching on that, um, and then also changing the language of our message. So Hartford is very diverse, and we also have a very uh, large Hispanic Latino population. So starting to do more of our communications in Spanish, uh, making sure that we're diversifying our staff and our board and our volunteers, um, because you want everyone walking through the door to feel at home, to feel comfortable, and to be okay with opening up about what they want to do and how they want to get things off the ground. But, but it's still a challenge, and it's, it's something that I think is very important. And as you think about, okay, what is it that we're going to do, you know, bring those things up, because it's important to tackle them in the beginning as you build out an infrastructure. Sarah? Um, I, I think uh, I, like, I, I like to use the term difference other than diversity, uh, because of one of my professors. Oh, sure, sorry. Um, I like to use the term difference for the diversity. Um, and I, I think that, uh, um, I think we go beyond uh, merely, merely trying to uplift diversity. We're, we're, so some folks in our in GMA will say, we're not doing co-op development for the sake of co-op development. Uh, we're doing all this work uh, as strategies for building power and building wealth in low-income communities of color. Um, so, you know, uh, if we are, if there's, and that is, that is a core premise to the Ujima project. Uh, so a lot of the work that we're trying to do is in that difficult space of trying to figure out uh, how do we design a system of um, coming up with business ideas, of, of financing business, um, startups and supporting them after they have launched uh, that is designed specifically for low-income com communities of color to identify their own needs and to meet their own needs so that um, people are really taking ownership of their uh, economic destinies. So one of the things that we uh, have been thinking about as part of the uh, planning process, oftentimes people who are, like, who are investment ready tend to be more, you know, tend to be a little bit wealthier, uh, a little more uh, privileged in, in specific ways. And there are other folks in the ground who need the sort of pre-assistance to become investment ready. Um, and uh, so that's, so, so those kinds of early supports and early identification uh, are things that um, Ujima is really, is really determined to do and to do well. Thank you guys.